Um, tonight, we are celebrating the contribution made by a unique gentleman and businessman. Uh, and before I took my position in Borgosh, I, I barely knew of Brian McCarthy, but I did know that he was a business stalwart from Kerry. But then I realized he was only on loan to the Green and Gold. When I got to meet Brian as a person, and I've done so constantly over the last uh, five years, you, you understand exactly what makes him very, very special. And I know people in FEXCO and people in Good Bodies know uh, exactly what I'm saying when I talk about um, Brian's modesty and his personal touch. But in particular, his entrepreneurial spirit is something absolutely to behold in terms of what he has created. As Simon said, from, not from a caravan in North Kerry, but not very far, I think, from a caravan, probably in South Kerry. He was educated in President, Presentation Brothers College in Cork, grew up on the Magazine Road, but like John Higgins and myself, uh, we all come from the same parish in Bishopstown, so the odd one out was the minister. But the minister did say there's a lot of Carrigaline people here tonight. <laughs> he, banked, he was a banker with all the Irish banks uh, from 1963 to 81, and Fexco was founded in 1981 and is based in Clorglin. And Brian was particularly honoured, and I need to emphasise this, by the sponsors, Ernst & Young, in 2002 as the International Entrepreneur of the Year Award. He has many interests. He's very involved in UCC Foundation, been the director of Radio Kerry, uh, he's very involved with the Irish Handicapped Children's Pilgrimage Trust, Trust and he's a keen interest in sports. He's never really answered the question to me whether he actually votes with the red and white or with the green and gold. He never tells anybody because, because he's living down in South Kerry. He wouldn't want to tell people. But the, the issue that I have to deal with, of course, is the fact that I, I grew up and played hurling with Bishopstown and we hated the bars hated St. Finbar's. And this guy was a St. Finbar's man. So you have to ask the question, why have I and the committee nominated a bars man to actually be recognized by us all tonight as making a very, very special contribution to the business well-being of this country? Brian McCarthy, I invite you up to accept your prize and tell us about yourself. Thank you, Brian. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, firstly, I would like to thank Cork Chamber of Commerce for this award, which, uh, <coughs> to be honest with you, I never expected to get uh, in my life. But here it is, and here I am to talk to you about uh, my experiences, because <coughs> When I asked, uh, or when I was asked to say a few words here, uh, I said, what do you want to know? What would you like me to speak about? <laughs> and they said, uh, well, your memoirs. I was trying to think. We call them memories in Kerry. <laughs> so... I, I will endeavour to, to uh, tell you some of my memories and uh, how significant they were. They, these events were in my life. <clears throat> and I suppose I will begin by uh, telling you that I joined the Munster Newster Bank in 1963, early in 63, at 66 South Malik Hawk. Now, the Munster Newster Bank was founded in 1885 but it was a, a successor to a previous bank called the Munster Bank, which failed around that time, but had been there since 1864. And the Murphy family of Murphy's Brewery were the main 
uh, supporters of the new Munsterminster Bank. And by the time I joined it in 1963, it had 140 branches all over the country. And it was quite a successful bank, probably the second biggest in the country. Now, <clears throat> the people who founded it were still in charge of it, in control of it, when I joined. And uh, headquarters was on the Mall, and it was a proud monument to the business acumen of those families who were still in existence at that time. And I will name some of them. There were the, the punches, uh, would, uh, there were um, um, uh, Dwyer's, Murphy's, and so on. Uh, they all, and they were still on the board of the bank at that time. Uh, they met four times a week, the board of the bank, right through the year, to uh, sanction loans and to conduct the business of the bank, and also to uh, interview any new employees of the bank. Each one had to be interviewed by the board. When they had all that work done, they would have lunch and Woodford Bournes used to supply the tariff. <laughs> so um, I, I joined that, that type of bank, and uh, it, it, it was, uh, I must say, even though it was old fashioned, and still is probably, it was uh, solvent, and it contributed to the growth of Cork City and the surrounding area. So, um, I, I recently read a, a book by uh, Bill O'Herley, his autobiography, uh, recently uh, printed. And um, his first couple of chapters, uh, I, I could subscribe to them, and I, I could understand exactly what he was talking about. Because he spoke of Cork in the 40s and 50s, and the family atmosphere, and the way people looked after each other, etc., etc. But, uh, you know, he, he seems to have avoided some of the, the, lesser, uh, the more, less exciting things that happened in Cork. And I felt that, uh, you know, uh, some of the things he, he, he left out could have been said because it wasn't all good at that time, I, I remember. Because, first of all, inflation, or, or not inflation, but uh, emigration was, was um, endemic. Unemployment was very high. Uh, and the unemployment assistance was hardly existed at all. So um, I, um, I, I, I say I was with, uh, or sorry, I'm um, a neighbour of Bill's because Bill came from uh, the Glashine Road, and I was from the Magazine Road. And he he went to Glashine School. He was two years ahead of me, and uh, I I used to go across the fields, no less to school in Glasheen at that time in the early 50s, late 40s. And um, it was a good school run by John Crowley, uh, high standard of education. Um, and then I went on to Prez, where um, I met some extraordinary teachers. I'm sure a lot of you here would remember some of them, like Dan Donovan, Freddie Holland, um, Bill O'Driscoll, Alfie Madden. Th those, those guys stood out in my, my, my uh, early history in, in, in Cork. Anyway, having joined the bank, things moved on for a few years. And in 1966, a terrible thing happened. There was a strike. Staff went out on strike, including myself. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, while we were on a strike, it was announced that the Bank of Ireland had bought the National uh, Bank and, and, and the Hibernian Bank. And now there was one big bank in the country and a whole lot of small ones, including the Munster Bank. <clears throat> you can imagine the kind of trouble that caused at the board, which met every day in Cork. <laughs> Not alone did they meet every day, they, must, they met every day of the week seven days and seven nights, trying to figure out how they were going to react to this new bank in, 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 town, or in the country. And it was said 
that there was going to be a merger between the Munster Bank, the Provincial Bank, and the Royal Bank. But nobody knew anything about it. <laughs> I worked in the department, which was the Chief Accountant's Department, <clears throat> and um, we, we were more than concerned because we were wondering what was going to happen to us if it was going to be a merger. So uh, nobody was telling us. And uh, at that time, uh, the, the auditors from Dublin used to come for two or three weeks every year. And uh, to be honest, they were a strange bunch. <laughs> they were from the big accounting firms, uh, big, one of the big accounting firms in Dublin. First difference between the auditors of then and today is that they were all male. Second thing is that they never spoke to each other as far as they could figure out. <laughs> And the third thing about them was that they all wore three-piece suits. <laughs> and, and they were impeccably attired. So uh, I decided that maybe these guys knew what was going to happen in the future. And uh, I addressed the question to the uh, managing partner. I said, uh, Mr. Mooney, um, are you going to be doing this audit next year? And he fixed me with a steely eye. And he said, young man, he said, in time of war, one does not discuss true movements. <laughs> so uh, from that day to this, I'm very wary of asking any direct questions of an auditor. <laughs> anyway, um, the, the, uh, the, the merger took place and uh, M&L, South Mel, lost out. Headquarters was going to be in Dublin. I went to work in the Foreign Department in Dublin. And uh, later on, I worked in the um, marketing department where I met a good friend of mine for the first time, Bob Ryan, who was the head of PR and who's here this evening. And I'm glad, Bob, that you're here. Uh, <laughs> but by, the way, by the way, Bob is also an eminent artist and is well known for his paintings around the, in the country. I spent some time there, and eventually I was transferred to Kilorglin, where I met my good friend John O'Connell. He was a manager. And he's here tonight, too. John, welcome. Uh, uh, now, uh, J John has uh, one, one claim to fame, and that is that uh, he worked for many years on the Mall himself when I was there, uh, but he also has one signal honour, that is, he has a county medal with the bars, <laughs> and he's in South Kerry. Um, so, uh, in 1979, <clears throat> uh, a notice appeared on the, on the Times, I think, or, or one of the, some of the financial papers anyway, that uh, the previous day there had been an extraordinary event. The um, Irish pound was trading at a premium to sterling. Now, this was an extraordinary thing because for 200 years since the Act of Union, there, were, there was parity between sterling and the Irish pound. And that had, that had for me, a, a, a very big significance because it was quite obvious that there was going to be about 200% more foreign exchange circulating in the market and it would be much more freely, uh, freely used by more people than tourists. And um, I watched with some interest this, this development and shortly afterwards, the central bank applied to people who were knowledgeable in this area to open a bureau de change. And a friend of mine in Killarney had a shop. He opened one. And I saw the, the returns that he had, the, sale, the purchase of foreign exchange. It was unbelievable. Now, we, were, we were told in banking circles that this thing couldn't work because nobody would go into a bureau de change when the bank was, was, was giving them better rate. 
But of course, the error was that people will, because people will go for service more than convenience, and uh, or, or, or for, 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 for a better rate. So uh, this, this was a, of quite an interest to me. And uh, I hit on the idea of maybe if you had more than one viewer of Sean's, and because um, tourism was uh, uh, seasonal, cyclical in the country, that maybe there was an opportunity for having many. And uh, I inquired as to whether the central bank would give a license for more than one under the, under the one company, and they said they would. So I, I, in 1981, following a bit of a dream, I left the AIB and we set up a precursor of Flexco. And within two years, uh, by using programmable calculators and so on, we had 200 shops around the country who were providing beer to challenge to, to tourists. We had to sell all the, cost the currency to the bank at the time, so we weren't getting that high margin. <clears throat> uh, good enough, though. And in <laughs> in, in, in 1984, another stroke of luck. Uh, the, um, there was a directive from Brussels to say that um, in future, tourists who could prove that they brought goods out of the country that were bought, uh, purchased here would be entitled to get a, a refund of VAT on their on their the goods they bought. And um, some of these shops where we had the bureaus had come to me and said, we're having trouble with this because we're sending out Irish pound checks and refund of the VAT, and they're mainly to Americans, and Irish pound checks in America are worse than useless. Uh, could you, could, have you any solution to that? I said, why don't you send them a dollar check? So, <laughs> He said, we don't have a dollar account. So I said, uh, gee, I think I could have you, you know. <laughs> and out of that grew uh, Fexco Tax Free Shopping, which uh, by uh, 1985, we had uh, 1,000 shops affiliated to it in Ireland. And uh, we had purchased um, a North Star multi-user PC, 10, 10 users. And that was going full belt for the whole, for the whole year with 10 people. <laughs> Kicking key, key, in the stuff. And uh, at that time, uh, shortly after that, we decided this might work in, in, in Scotland too. And uh, yeah, it did. And uh, <laughs> the Bank of Scotland uh, got interested in it, and we formed a joint venture about 1986 with the Bank of Scotland. And as quick as you could, as you, uh, quicker than I ever imagined, anyway, we had uh, all of the big stop shops in the UK including Marks and Spencers and Harrods and Equiscoot, all them, all the big ones. And we were doing a million transfer, a million a year, a million uh, refunds a year or more. Shortly after that, about 19, about 19, um, 80, 88 or 87 or 8, uh, we, we had uh, Fronton in Paris and uh, Gallery Lafayette. They were all our customers. And... Uh, it was a, a very, very good idea because it provided cash flow. When you've no capital, you need cash. And it, this provided a cash flow, which was very important to us at the time. And around 1989, we had a, a problem with the size of our computer. We needed to get a new one. And the price was two million for a computer that would do what we wanted it to do. Uh, and yet, yet it did, but unfortunately, it had much more capacity than we wanted, but there was no middle-sized one, if you could imagine. <laughs> so uh, we said we were lucky that the, the, uh, the prize bonds, uh, the Department of Finance, uh, tendered, uh, asked us to tender for the prize bonds, which we did, among others, and we won the tender. And in 1989, we took 11 million documents from Dublin down, down to Kerry, and we computerized them within a year on the new uh, uh, Unisys 2200, 400 mainframe computer. 
um, around the same time. A lot of things happened around this time. It was kind of a frenetic time. Around 1990, uh, Western Union came and asked us, would we like to, uh, to be their agents in Ireland? We said, of course, yes. And we, we did no business. But within a year, we acquired our UK business for a nominal sum. Uh, very, very profitable. They were losing money. We transferred a call centre from London to Kerry. And in no time at all, we had 150 people working in, on Western Union, UK and Ireland, in Kerry, on a call centre. Uh, shortly after that, we bought uh, the uh, agency for Spain. And then uh, we acquired, later on, uh, an agency for uh, Nordic countries, uh, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Finland. <coughs> uh, with the result that by about 1998, we had 11,000 outlets for Western Union in Europe. We sold that just some, some, a few years back to Western Union. Uh, but we still have uh, agencies in uh, Fiji, Samoa, Tonga, Timor, Vanuatu, uh, and so on. So uh, we, we, we're still operating those ones, and they're, they're, they're doing okay too. Uh, so all of this activity with computers and payments and all that spawned a whole lot of other ideas, like for instance our, our corporate payments, which uh, we, have, we have a lot of customers in Ireland, mainly government departments, universities and so on, uh, that has been very successful. It came out of our payment, for our uh, VAT payments business. And they do swift payments and, and uh, forward contracts and all that kind of thing at the moment. Um, and on the other side, we started to develop uh, capabilities with credit cards. We used to make credits in US dollars and yen to credit card holders abroad. So uh, that changed to be a debit and became what we call DCC, Dynamic Currency conver Conversion at the Point of Sale. That is now our, very, our biggest business, and we are operating in 20 countries around the world, and we, a lot of our staff are out there at the moment developing that. Uh, in recent times, our biggest activity, our biggest um, uh, uh, single uh, opportunity was uh, we, we, we had a small stockbroking company we started in 1989 too, and we, we acquired uh, Good Body Stockbrokers, which is the second biggest in the country, and we're very happy to be involved with Good Bodies. Um, as I said, all of these developments were, were, were founded on, a, first of all, uh, a, a technical capability. Secondly, was found on good management techniques. Thirdly, we had enthusiasm from our staff in all these cases, and still have to this day. So we are continuing to develop new ideas in how, in how, to, um, how, how, how payments are going to be made in the future, smartphones, uh, near field communications, NFC, and so on. All of these things are we're researching them at the moment. And we're building faster and more modern switching techn technology in Kilarga. So, um, so what, what, well, if there's any uh, message to be given from all of this, it is that uh, if you start something and it's successful, it is not so much that particular idea that will produce the employment and the growth. It's probably something else that you never even thought of. And uh, we still work on that principle that there are lots of things we haven't thought about yet, which we can do in the future. Uh, so we are, at all times, our people are exploiting market, market opportunities. Uh, they're uh, adapting to rapidly changing environment for payments and, and everything else besides. Uh, and we're always trying to anticipate what the future might be like so that we can be ready 
to, uh, to uh, take on change and to create a, a, a new system. Um, so this evening, when I get this award, I'm more, more than happy to say it's not, it's, 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 it's not deserved. There are people who did a lot more than, 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 than I ever did, but I still accept it uh, for, what, for what it is. It is a sign that my uh, people in Cork City are still aware of, the, uh, of those who are working far from home. <laughs> so, uh, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to thank uh, particularly the, the Cork Chamber of Commerce and um, uh, John Mullins for the kind words he said about me and Conor Healy who organised it tonight. And uh, I'd like to thank my own family for uh, being uh, uh, supportive of, of me in times when uh, I was hardly ever at home. Uh, and it wasn't uh, just two days a week or three days a week, it could be weeks on, on end that I might be away somewhere else. And uh, I thank Mary and family for all their support during that time. Um, <laughs> And uh, lastly, I'd like to thank uh, John Higgins for the support of this event this evening. And I'm more than grateful for the kind words that have been said about me. Thank you. Thank you.